Mayor, uh, we're sitting in a room this morning with about a thousand members of the land and development community. It's a very important industry in the city of Toronto. It's a very busy industry. How important is development, real estate development, to the success of Toronto? Well, I think the very fact, as you heard uh, Jennifer saying, that, uh, that transit and housing are going to be the two things that I think uh, we have to focus on to keep uh, that growth going successfully and in a way that is sustainable and livable um, indicates that this part of, uh, this part of it, and, and, and you heard her also in her remarks link something that I think is inextricably linked, which is transit and housing and development together. And so, uh, to me, um, it's, it's obviously uh, the case that this industry represents a lot of jobs and a lot of importance to the economy in and of itself, but I think much more than that, uh, the way in which we develop the city, the type of development we do, the, whether or not the development industry helps us to meet the needs uh, that the city has, and we have some areas right now where we have significant deficits, are going to be crucially important to our future prosperity. Uh, people are only going to come in, when people make the decision to invest here, when I've been at the meetings, when you hear about talking about Amazon, on and some of these other multinational companies, whether they're big, big ones that are well known or not. The fact is what they talk about in the context of Toronto and what makes it attractive is first and foremost, I'll admit, talent and the diversity of talent. But the second thing they talk about in various different ways is the livability of the city. And livability has to include um, you know, our ability to, uh, to have everybody live here. Uh, those very same corporations, big and small, and businesses and, and academic institutions have by definition people who are higher income uh, earners who uh, hold various positions in their, in their ranks, but they also have other people who don't make as much uh, money. And if we sort of are not careful in terms of how we develop the city, um, we will make the city less attractive for people to invest. And I'm a, I'm a free enterpriser and therefore understand and believe that the only place that wealth is created is in the private sector. And if we don't have that kind of investment coming from within and from without, and it's true of all cities because I know there are people here from other parts of the country, then um, you know the city will still be here, it'll still function, but it will not be showing the kind of growth and vitality that's attractive and a magnet to people from around the world. So to me, this business in and of itself, but also what it does and how it does it in partnership with governments is crucially important to whether we're able to take the city and, and make it you know, as livable and, and uh, as attractive in 25 years as it is today. Thank you. So let's talk about transit. We all like transit. There we are. Now this is an image of the new transit hub at East Harbor. This is the transit hub which is uh, going to start construction next year. Uh, Metrolinx is committed to having service in this location uh, in 2021. And we all know the importance of building transit for the strength of the city. Now, could you talk a bit about your transit priorities uh, for the next uh, term? Well, what we now have for the first time, and it's hard to believe that never before in the history of Toronto have we had a network transit plan that really is meant to cover multiple projects over many years. And we now have one. It's been approved by the City Council. And as you know, in our system, uh, where there are no parties, and that's not a complaint, it's just an observation of fact, um, that is no mean feat to get a plan of that substance approved by the City Council. And so it is approved, and it has multiple projects within it that include uh, the Smart Track uh, initiative that's going to go by uh, East Harbor. It includes the uh, Bloor Danforth subway extension, waterfront uh, transit, uh, the relief line, which is a hugely important project, uh, and so on. Uh, the extensions to the Eglinton LRT uh, network at the east and the west ends. And now the challenge becomes to implement it. Uh, it's one thing to have a plan, as we all know, uh, from business or government. It's another thing to implement it. I will tell you that I have nine billion reasons to be happy that we didn't have at the beginning of the uh, council that I lead this term, uh, and that is in the form of support from the other two gov governments, and I think that is true of cities around the country because of the initiatives of the federal government who, for the first time, have taken a meaningful, I'll call it permanent role, but a meaningful year-after-year -year role in the funding of transit, and the province here uh, has been a good partner. And so I think the objective, though, and, and it isn't just about drawing lines on a map. I'll confess to you that when people like the mayor of Tokyo uh, come to visit me and for some reason or other, I think maybe just to punish me, show me their transit map, I weep. I mean, because, you know, we have one that has two lines on it, essentially. You all know the lines, the, Bloor, uh, the uh, Young University subway line and the Bloor Danforth line. And our map must look much different, and it mustn't look much different just so that we can keep up with all the other major cities that are like us, I believe Toronto, and we have several, you know, Canadian cities that are global cities. But 
more because we've got to connect people to opportunity. We've got to take some of the neighborhoods, and if you looked at the biggest single uh, you know, threat I think the city faces, this city, um, in the coming years, it is in fact um, not one of transit and housing. Those are uh, contributing factors to the biggest single challenge we face, it's a better word, which is the growing isolation of some communities in a big city like this and the growing marginalization of some of the people who live there. And transit is really going to be built to connect people to opportunity, to create an attractive place where the private sector and government can invest in places other than just downtown. Um, and I think it is, uh, it is essential that we proceed with this plan. Now I will say to you, and I'm saying this not by way of a complaint as much as by an observation, we seem to have, and I'll speak only for Toronto here because I don't know what goes on in the other cities in Canada, but we seem to have an overwhelming desire to continue to debate these things endlessly, even after a transit a network transit plan has been approved, after a great deal of discussion, we want to revisit these things, and that is to me a, a huge a threat to our ability to get things done and to maintain prosperity, to make it, um, you know, to, to help uh, fill in the puzzle pieces that are necessary to help you decide where you're going to go uh, to develop, uh, including places other than downtown Toronto. And I am just, uh, it, it's very frustrating for me as somebody who is, comes from a private sector background and wants to get things done, recognizing the need for appropriate public process and consultation and so on, but I don't get um, you know, what happens when you make decisions, and you make decisions, and in our system, of course, there's always going to be uh, some people who are in favor and some people who aren't. But, you know, we have a system that says once you decide, you decide, except in government, where, and except maybe in civic government in Toronto when it comes to transit, where people want to have these debates endlessly and not actually build anything. And I, uh, I find that frustrating, but I'm going to be very determined, uh, as I've ever been about anything in my life, to build this transit because it is going to provide the impetus for this business and for other kinds of employers uh, to make the investments they need to make to create the jobs to keep Toronto prosperous. Uh, okay, so we talk about transit as a way to move people, but we also talk about transit as a catalyst for economic development. Um, at East Harbour, the development is very clear. There'll be up to 15 million square feet of economic development associated with that transit hub. And at East Harbour, the private sector is contributing to the cost of the construction and development of that station. How can we leverage private sector how can we help expand that network and how can we help create those jobs and economic development in other locations? Well, there's a couple of things I'd say about that. First of all, I'm very heartened by some of the examples we have, and they're not all exactly the same, but the one uh, with, uh, um, with, with um, East Harbour. Um, is one that I think uh, we're going to have to emulate. I mean, not only is it desirable, I think it's going to be necessary. And it's necessary in the mutual self-interest of both of those involved, if I can call the one side of it, the public interest, and the other side is whatever the private interest is. And in this case, at, at East Harbor, what we're going to get is we're going to get uh, a quality development with a place for thousands of jobs, and uh, it's going to be sort of an anchor for an overall redevelopment of a precinct of the city where hopefully people will work and live and play. Um, but we're also going to get better transit as a result, which will serve not only that development, but it will it'll serve uh, the people on sort of either side of it, as it were. And I think that those partnerships are going to be necessary going forward. I mean, we have a different one taking place at Woodbine. I mean, Woodbine, I'm not a big casino person. I've made that very clear. But I saw a casino there, and there's already gambling there of different kinds, as a catalyst to a very significant development in a part of the city that badly uh, needs it. And there will be, again, a partnership there of transit because when that development takes place and when all those jobs are created and people will uh, live and work and play there, there's going to have to be even better transportation to get them to and from uh, those opportunities. And that's in one of the most disadvantaged parts of the city relative to job creation. And so there will be a partnership there. There will be another partnership of a different kind at Liberty Village. But the bottom line is the days where the government just builds everything, does it all itself, um, I don't think you even want the government to do it all itself because it won't necessarily produce a product, if I can call it that, that is commensurate with the overall needs of the development. And so I think that these kinds of partnerships where people, yes, do make a contribution, but even more importantly, work in a partnership together to create the best possible results are a very good way to go, are a necessary way to go, and I don't think a lot of these things will happen without those partnerships. And so I would just say on that, and I'm sure we'll get to affordable housing, um, if the, the private sector ha has to step up, and I say that not wanting to sound like one of these politicians that sort of is saying that, 
you know, the private sector doesn't step up. You step up and make investments every day, but I think we have to step up now in a way that does it in partnership with government instead of you and government are sitting across the table, across the table in some kind of an adversarial way where we're the regulator and you're uh, trying to do something that we're going to do things together on the housing and on the transit uh, to produce a result that is going to be a sort of an integrated, sensible result um, that is going to allow for what is a much more complex task in trying to develop a city that is as developed as, as ours already is. And so I think these partnerships are absolutely crucial, and that does include, yes, um, some money. You know, I think uh, one thing that's been, uh, you know, I shake my head a little bit coming out of some of the meetings, and I'm sure there's lots of meetings where not only do you shake your head coming out of meetings with government, but I actually hear about it later, and that's fine. That's how the system works well, but I shake my head, you know, sometimes at the fact that an industry that, and I'm very happy about this, but an industry that's done very, very, very well in developing this city and other cities in Canada. Sometimes there's even a sense of a, of, of, of a front at the notion that there should be maybe a contribution made uh, to the public well-being that will allow the city to remain as attractive a place for you to make money going forward, whether that be in partnerships on transportation or whether it be on some contribution and in, in ingenuity you can apply to affordable housing. And I would just say I am a strong free enterpriser. I came from a business background. I understand that it is not only desirable, it is necessary for people to make money so they can go on to the next project, but it's also necessary for us uh, to make sure we build the infrastructure and don't build it 25 years later, but build it now when you're developing the city and build the affordable housing now so that everybody can live in the city and work for your companies and that we have to do that in partnership with each other. And so when we ask uh, for, for, for that kind of partnership, um, and sometimes, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, require it, um, it is because uh, I think we have to do things a little better than we've done perhaps over the last 20 or 30 years in making sure we do all of the things we have to do at once instead of doing the building uh, now and then sort of doing the infrastructure later. Okay, so we talk about subways, uh, we talk about new transit, um, we are, we're asking the private sector to do their part. Uh, we know how difficult and expensive it is to build subways, and yet we know that we have to build them. And yet 25, 30 or more years ago, probably much more than that, there was a subway built along Bloor Danforth. And I drive along Bloor Danforth today, and I see two and three story buildings. It's, it actually makes me feel sick to think that you know, we drive along and that the people uh, along those areas are, are, seem to be unable to densify and create the density and the housing and the commercial space that this city needs. There's nothing more sustainable than building along existing infrastructure and utilizing existing infrastructure. So other than Young and Bloor and a couple of other nodes, it, it, it's very, very low intensity. And we all know that there's the nimbyism that goes on. How are we going to change that? How are we going to densify Bloor Danforth? There's all kinds of opportunities. Well, I think it starts with determination, and by the way, I don't apply the determination as much to people in this room as I do to, um, to elected leadership and also to uh, people who are going to think about this in a common sense way, and I'll come back to that because I think people have to be better informed. I think there has arisen as a result of experiences people have had that get a lot of publicity and so on the notion that the only thing that is going to happen along a subway line uh, is going to be a 50-story or 35-story building, um, whereas, um, you know, we've seen successfully in some areas where uh, hard work has been done, including by people in, in uh, Jennifer's former department and, and, and by the private sector, to build mid-rise that is extremely compatible um, with uh, uh, adjacent neighborhoods, but at the same time provides more housing than two, the traditional two-story uh, you know, retail at ground and, and uh, an apartment above. Um, and we desperately need that housing, which can, by definition, be affordable. Um, and, and probably in, 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 well, in many cases now will be going forward. Uh, but I think the determination has to rest with the elected officials to do a better job themselves instead of reacting to uh, those who would, uh, um, you know, sort of say any development is bad development and just leave things the way they are, have to sort of have a quiet determination to make sure that some uh, intensification takes place along all of those transit lines. And that's one of the reasons why I've said that one of my priorities going forward in the next term, if I'm given a second term, will be uh, will be transit-oriented development because we simply cannot uh, continue to make not just the huge investment in transit but to ignore the sensibility of having uh, people who have the same joy that people have living downtown where they can walk to work, they can cycle to work, uh, or they can use transit going to work but they don't have to drive a car. Um, and, and I have a balanced view, sometimes to the frustration of 
of people who write me up, uh, you know, in, in terms of all of this business of transportation and mobility in the city, but I sure do recognize the fact we can't go on having everybody uh, thinking they need to or thinking they even want to use a car to get everywhere. We have to sort of continue to drive up, I believe, in an incremental, uh, measured way, uh, the, the attractiveness of people being able to use other means of transportation to get to where they need to go other than, uh, other than the car. And that means, more, among other things, more transit-oriented uh, development. And then the biggest thing that I think has to happen in a certain way, and this is the hardest one, uh, is going to be the matter of what I'll call public education, for lack of any better expression. When I look at some of the plans, because uh, Jennifer was one of those who helped educate me, I came to City Hall, I'd never worked there before, hadn't been involved in the intricacies of, of, of planning and so on, but when I look at some of the ways in which, say, along Eglinton, we found attractive ways and compatible ways to sort of scale development uh, because it's immediately adjacent to neighborhoods that have been there for a long time, it can be done. It can be done by you with your own ingenuity. It can be done by us in the context of our regulatory responsibilities. But the bottom line is it has to get done. Um, and it has to get done not in the way that everybody comes along and says they want to build a 50-story building or 35, because frankly, that isn't compatible um, with a lot of the neighborhoods that we so treasure and that people admire when they come to see this city as a place to live or to invest. So I just think we have to uh, do better, much better than we've done, because right now we have transit lines that are built. Um, you know, I would not be as supportive of building the extension to the Bloor Danforth subway to Scarborough were it not for the fact that I know from people who've actually submitted applications or are about to do so, there's going to be significant development at the end of, or the, the new end of that subway line, which is going to make it possible for all those people to come and go from there by public transportation and be connected up to the rest of the city. And I think this is going to be a huge magnet for development, but also an opportunity to give thousands and thousands more people a chance to uh, be able to have that access to public transportation that they presently don't have. Okay, so let's talk about economic development. Um, the city is growing. Uh, in the news every day, we hear about it when a, another major international company that wants to come to Toronto. We hear about Amazon, we hear about Google, we hear about all kinds of these world, well-known international companies. And they want to be here and or at least they say they want to be here, but we haven't really seen any announcements yet. So what is it that we can do in the private sector and through government to help attract, and, and what is it do you believe that's attracting them to come to Toronto? What, what's so special about Toronto? Well, I know what they're interested in because I've had a chance to sit in the meetings, including some of the ones where we're competing now to get investments. And I would say, by the way, that while you're right, there haven't been sort of blockbuster announcements of the of the order of Amazon, there have been lots of announcements happening in the city and lots of people that have just been quietly coming here and dramatically expanding their offices. Uh, I think of a company, and I don't want to cause any trouble with my friends in Ottawa, including Mayor Jim Watson, but you know, Shopify uh, didn't have an office in Toronto, really, of, of substance. Then they did establish a modest one because their head office, of course, in the place where they were founded and where they still are proud to call their home is Ottawa. But we now have an office here of Shopify with hundreds of employees, and there's example after example of after example of that of both Canadian and, and international firms that have established here and created hundreds of jobs here. And when you sit with the people like the Amazons, we're not supposed to talk about any conversations we've had with them for fear of some terrible fate uh, befalling us. But um, when you sit with them, and when you sit with these other multinational firms and smaller firms, um, what they talk about and what they ask you questions about more so than anything else, I will say the number one thing that they're looking for here and that they find here and that they're in some respects incredibly impressed by here is the talent pool that we have and the diversity. You cannot imagine the importance that diversity represents to a lot of these uh, people who look to invest here. Why? Because they understand in this world that we live in in 2018, the ability to attract and embrace and keep and, and legally have come into our country the best and the brightest from around the world is hugely important. Somebody told me last night, and I've forgotten the number now, somebody here will know it, but that the percentage of people in Silicon Valley who are in the upper level positions, who are people who are from diverse backgrounds around the world, is huge. It's not all Americans. In fact, there's huge numbers of Canadians there too, as we all know, and I've been down there trying to lure them back. But the number one thing that they talk about is the talent and the diversity of talent. But after that, almost all of their questions relate to what I'll call the quality of life. And when you burrow down into that, there are a number of different uh, things that, relate, that that relates to. Uh, our values are important and the way we live together and the way we embrace diversity and, and so on. But after that, it becomes things that we've just been talking about, the bread and butter of what you're doing at this meeting, which is uh, the ability to get around the city, the ability for the city to be a sustainable, pleasant place to live, and the ability to find somewhere to live in the city that is affordable and that is 
uh, in a neighborhood that is, um, you know, that is compatible for families and so on. And that is why this, uh, if we've got the transit plan, which I believe we now do, and if we could just stop having endless debates about it and stop uh, people playing politics with it and just build it, um, then I think we'll have, we can't stop there, but I think that plan, if all of it, its elements were to be built, and large parts of it are now financed, thanks to good partnership with the other two governments for the first time in the history, the $9 billion I made reference to, and then we can do an equal push to have an equally ambitious plan with your help and your ingenuity and your ambition, and the government being a partner in that to deal with affordable housing, um, I think we will have, together with our values and our diversity and our talent pool, absolutely the most attractive package to offer people in the world. As it is, I think, today, but I think we have some danger signs that, that cause us to see that imperiled if we don't address especially the housing issue and if we don't get on with building the transit. You know, I think that that, 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 that plus the talent are the reasons and our way of life that people want to come here. I mean, it's no accident when you think about other cities in Canada that I think it's in the 10 most livable cities in the world. I think three of them are Canadian out of, I think, 4,400 cities in the world. What an extraordinary thing this is, but let's look at why that is, and it's the way we live. It's the diversity and the, the acceptance of each other in the context of that diversity and the ability to attract the best and the brightest from around the world, but it also has to be the livability of the cities in the context of the transit and the housing and other issues that relate to, um, you know, to the quality of, of our urban uh, experience here. And I, I've had some criticism from people say, I'm not moving fast enough to sort of embrace uh, some of the things that uh, uh, you know, people believe, I think correctly, will form um, you know, a large part of maintaining quality of life going forward. And a lot of it has to do with transportation and, and street design and this kind of thing. I will only say to you, the judgment I have to make in my job as the elected leader of the city and the leader of the council is how, how fast you have your hand, how, you know, where you have your hand on the throttle. And I believe that you have to have people go with you, just like we were talking about for the development in the neighborhoods. If you don't have the people with you and they end up fighting you uh, because they think you're doing something too fast or too, too much change at a given point in time, you won't get it done. And so to me, that is an incredibly frustrating thing to be in a position where you know it needs to be done, but because you don't uh, you know, adjust the throttle properly, um, that people then resist you and become your enemy instead of becoming your partner and moving these things forward. So I make no apologies for the fact that I have been prepared to be, um, I think, showing an invested degree of political capital when it comes to the King Street pilot project to move people, the Bloor, Bloor Street bike lanes, but at the same time, it has to be my judgment, and I will be held accountable for it in a few months' time uh, as to how quickly we can do these things and how much time we have to spend educating people, if I can use that word, as to where the cities are going in the future. Other cities are doing things faster and slower than we are um, in Canada and elsewhere, but we have our own job to do here to make these things happen. But happen they must, because that's what people are coming for, the talent and the quality of life here, and quality of life as determined, principally and not exclusively by transit and, and uh, the availability of places to live. Okay, Mayor, so I, I, I think we'd all agree that diversity, our immigration policies are a real competitive advantage for the city of Toronto. But I'm gonna to throw something else out. I wanna talk about healthcare and our educational institutions. Uh, when we're talking to international companies today, uh, the quality of our healthcare and the health and wellness of our population, publicly funded education, and the quality of our educational institutions, these are real competitive advantages. I think that when, the next time I'm pitching somebody whether it's in Europe or in the United States, I'm gonna bring the president of the university and one of the hospitals along because I, I think that that's one of our real advantages in the city of Toronto. Do you wanna to comment on that? You'll discuss our Amazon bid later today, but being a part of that bid, I can only tell you that the, our bid, and we made it public so that people could see what it said, and we were anxious they should see all the good things that it said, and it's been downloaded 13,000 times since it was put online, and I think only two of the city's bidding made their bids public at the outset. We did right from the beginning. And what did it not say, I guess, starting with that? It did not say we were going to write some big fat check uh, to Amazon if they came here. And part of that was because we uh, thought that was a kind of zero-sum game uh, to begin with. But secondly, um, it was, uh, it, you know, we discussed long and hard the fact that even if somebody wanted to write the check, that what do you do with the next company that comes along and the one after that? So what did we do instead? We leveraged our competitive advantages. And when you explain, as many, um, many of you, I'm sure, have done with uh, Americans and people from outside of the country, um, the advantages of public systems of healthcare and education, um, they quickly understand what a huge competitive advantage it is on the healthcare side. 
Um, it is something where the system works well, and, and when you need help, you get it. Uh, but even more importantly, from the standpoint of what we can say to a company like Amazon, and we can say it to many others, is that the cost savings for them compared to what they'd be paying uh, if they were having to buy the same coverage in the United States is massive. And so we didn't have to write a check um, you know, to say well, we're going to incent you uh, to come here. We said, well, the healthcare system exists as it is, and you can come here and you will benefit from that. But even more important than the healthcare system and that particular benefit, aside from the quality and the way it's financed, was our system of education. And what we explained to them there isn't so much the fact that it's a public system and therefore the government or the taxpayers are subsidizing people getting an excellent education, but rather that it allowed the government, and I think what has been a benign and constructive way, to maintain, again, its hand on the throttle so that we were able to say to them, and the centerpiece of our bid, as you'll hear, I'm sure, from uh, Toby Lennox this afternoon, was to say we will invest as a society, as a province, as a city, um, in making sure the pipeline of talent, excellent talent that is needed not only to look after Amazon's needs if they come here, but everybody else's, rests with our decision makers. So we can, through a public system of education, make the investment to increase the number of uh, science and technology and engineering graduates, such as to keep that pipeline full so that there's not the kind of likelihood that you will end up in a situation they've experienced elsewhere where they run out of talent and it all starts to compete with itself and simply drive up the price. And so uh, the excellence of our institutions plus the public ability we have because it's a public system uh, to influence the, the supply of talent in a positive way and, ac and actually redirect resources on an as-needed basis is a gigantic uh, competitive advantage. I don't think we've even realized uh, how, it, how, how significantly ad, uh, a bad advantage we are by that. And it has produced uh, the highest, if not among the very highest, rates of post-secondary education in the world right here. And so that plus the diversity plus the, plus the sort of existing talent base are hugely important to continue and our public systems seem to be, for us anyway, the best way we can move that forward and I don't think you hear anybody clamoring to change them. Okay, well, so we think Toronto's great. We think we've got all kinds of natural advantages. We're gonna build all kinds of transit so that everyone can get around and there's no traffic jams and, and life is great. But the question I have is, where is that growth gonna occur? Where are we going to provide the housing? Where are we going to provide the jobs for these people? So I have this slide up for a reason. I don't know, Mayor, if you can see it, but um, it shows uh, the area we call South Core, South of Union, uh, in 2001 and in 2017. In 2001, it's a beautiful field anchored on the west side by the CN Tower and the, uh, and the Rogers Center. I think it was called Sky Dome back then and on the east side by the uh, Air Canada Centre. And it's a nice big piece of land. It was about 40 or 50, uh, it's about 40 or 50 acres, and it was empty. And the slide on the right shows what's there today on that 40 or 50 acres. Today there's about 14 million square feet uh, that have been developed. About uh, two thirds of that is office employment and uh, three or four million feet of residential. Now, the first building, which was the TELUS building, didn't actually even open until 2009. So it's quite incredible that we have our own Canary Wharf for Hudson Yards, just a couple of blocks from where we're sitting right now, and most people don't realize that. This has happened in the last 10 or 15 years. So the question for you is, uh, where is that next growth going to occur? Where, where is it that we're going to be able to accommodate the growth over the next 10, 20, 30 years? Well, I mean, I think there's some obvious places, and I'll mention those briefly, and we know where they are. I mean, there's the Portlands, and there's the East Harbour area a little bit to the north of there. There is a continued expansion of, uh, of Liberty Village and, and so on. But I think we're also going to have to look and be creative and be, somebody's going to have to be bold. You know, uh, I guess what you said it was the TELUS was that was the first building. I've forgotten now, but whenever it was, it was a pioneering venture. Just like when, when uh, whoever built the Toronto Star building builds it at the foot of Young Street, like 50 years ago, people sort of said, why would they be building a building down there? And, you know, it was a pioneering venture. And I'm very hopeful because I think if we're going to knit this city together into one real powerhouse global city, uh, if we're going to accommodate the development need that you talked about, even if it's just to accommodate the people who are coming here year after year, and I say thank God for that, that they're coming because they're going to allow us to have a growing economy and to expand the talent pool that we're talking about and to continue to be a model to the world, 
uh, of getting the best and the brightest from around the world, that we're going to have to look further afield than that. We're going to have to look at transit-oriented development that happens in other parts of the city. So you're going to have to start talking about what do we do in Downsview where it, it, it's been a controversial subject locally, but there are all kinds of different pieces of land up there um, that uh, have uh, certainly the need for some employment. Uh, some employment uh, uses that, that people are going to have to sort of figure out in the context of somebody being a pioneer. Uh, we have Scarborough at the, at the, uh, at the, at the end of the expanded uh, subway line. Uh, we have the northwest corner of the city where there's going to be a significant development put in place at Woodbine that should be a catalyst, and that's what I hope it is, because I think what we have to do is not only spread that development around what is one city, but also make sure that we have opportunity closer to where those people live. There has been nothing take place, and I get it. I mean, I, am, I, I understand enough about business to know that people for six bucks a foot uh, you know, that they're going to get are not going to be rushing to go build buildings. So we're going to have to help to make it more attractive. But I believe in my heart that given that the people live there, a lot of the very same people that are going to work for the companies that are the employers, and that the people need affordable places to live and that people live there now, that we've got to build up these communities um, in places other than downtown to make sure that uh, we, we, we disperse the development in, in an orderly, thoughtful way, but also at the same time create a lot more opportunities closer to where those people actually live so they don't face the prospect of having to go downtown to work. That's not punishment, but is it necessary and is it really appropriate going forward as the city grows to millions and millions of more people that we have everything going on downtown? Of course not. And so we have to find a way to make that opportunity more attractive and to have some pioneers demonstrate that it can be attractive um, to go into those parts of the city, especially those that are going to be served by the future transit network, um, to accommodate the pressures of development. And I, I'm very confident in what you said, because just as the South Core didn't exist a number of years ago, and the Toronto Star Building, when it was built 50 years ago, was in, a, in the midst of nothing, there was nothing there, and you could give countless other examples, so too will be the case with East Harbour, uh, with uh, the Portlands, with uh, other parts of the city, I hope as well, including uh, parts in the inner suburbs that uh, desperately need to have uh, some gesture of confidence uh, from the private sector and from government in order to stimulate development there that isn't just going to be good for us in terms of pressures, but also good uh, for us in terms of, uh, of, of uh, uh, guaranteeing greater uh, equitable access to opportunity. Well, and one other point I think it's important to make. Since 2001, the GTA has grown by a million and a half people and continues to grow by 100,000 people a year. So every 10 years, and it may be accelerating, another million people uh, reside in the GTA. So as fast as this happened, with a million and a half or two million more people, how much quicker could it happen next time? So that, that leads uh, to the discussion that is so important, which is housing. And of course, everything surrounds East Harbor. You notice how that just sort of happened to occur here. It was a complete coincidence. Um, but uh, this is uh, a question that's obviously very important and very important to you, Mayor. Uh, how are we going to accommodate housing in this growing city of ours? Well, there are tools that are being given to us now, and they're not tools you necessarily all like, but they're tools, I guess, that perhaps uh, came about of necessity to a certain extent in order to make sure that we can address the number one thing that we have to address with respect to housing, which is not just supply. I mean, obviously, we've actually had a lot of new supply uh, in the last number of years, but the question is, how much of that supply have we had that's affordable housing, whether it be ownership or more particularly rental? And the answer is, not enough. You know, I'm, I'm proud to say, and again, I get, uh, you know, a lot of criticism, and believe me, I don't, the criticism... Uh, especially at my advanced age, I don't, like I just look at it and say, well, you could wake up and say it's Tuesday today and there'd be somebody who'll disagree with you. But having said that, I mean, the fact is that, that we had housing targets set in this city in 2009. I don't know who thought this number up or thought it was ambitious, but it was that 1,000 uh, units of affordable housing be approved every year in 2009. And I guess it turned out they were ambitious because the fact is we didn't meet that target once until last year. And so my theory now is, or not my theory, my profound belief and my determination going forward if I'm given four more years, is that we have to take that number and it's sort of what prompted that conversation that Jennifer referred to that I had with her. And I think creative housing that she's a part of now is going to be part of the answer, but you are part of this answer too. And we were given some tools like inclusionary zoning and so on because um, there wasn't enough being done in this area. Um, so that's the sort of the stick. But I'd much prefer to see you with all the ingenuity that is represented in this room that's done all the great work that you've done and found ways to make money at it and found ways to make it most of the time attractive in the context of a, of a livable city to bring the same ingenuity and the same determination and the same desire to do well um, to affordable housing. 
and, and to help us to make sure that we, we, we make a thousand uh, units a year approved by the city look like uh, something that was a, a pittance. You know, we've got to substantially drive those numbers up. And, and I just believe the talent rests in this room and the ingenuity working with government and we have to be better partners, um, which I think we can be in terms of both incentives and other things we can do and including the process. We had a great meeting the other day, you'll be pleased to know some of the people were there, um, to sort of have for the first time, I think, all the department heads of the city at, in the room at once, sitting across the table from some of the major people in the development industry so that you couldn't get you know, the blame placed on some guy that wasn't at the meeting uh, for the fact that things take so long. And we're gonna continue with that now to sort of say, look, we are going to operate on our, I don't even like to say our side of the table, but on our side of the table as a group of people who try to do things better together instead of the silo approach and sit there together and are accountable together. Um, but I think we have to have the same on the other side of the table, which is, you know, that there has to be a recognition of the fact that if the city's gonna be successful and accommodate those people, many of whom do not make big incomes and who are needed to, to, uh, to be a part of the uh, employment base of the city and, and that we want a city that consists of mixed, uh, a mixed uh, population when it comes to socioeconomic factors, that you have to provide part of the answer to that with us in partnership. All right, Mayor, well, we're into not only a municipal election, but we're also into a provincial election. Um, like any election, the outcome is uncertain. We don't know who the next premier is going to be. We don't know who the next government of Ontario is going to be. But clearly, there are different platforms and different approaches to all kinds of issues which impact our city. Uh, how is the city going to adapt and relate to government, whether it's the current or a new government? How are we gonna deal with that? Is this a threat? No, I, I don't see it as a threat. I see it as simply what goes on in, in the business of, uh, of a democracy. And uh, in my case, uh, I've tr tried to show an absolute determination from day one to recognize that it is my responsibility to work with whoever is in the other governments, just as they don't get to pick who the mayor of Toronto is. Uh, you know, I don't get to pick who the prime minister or the premier is, they're picked by the voters. And so I saw it as my business when Stephen Harper was the Prime Minister of Canada to go as I did in a determined and repeated and frequent way to convince him as I did not alone, but I was one of the ones that convinced him to establish as they did the first uh, transit fund that became a permanent feature of federal government participation in public transit, which Canada was the only Western, major Western economy not to have its federal government involved on a permanent basis. And so we worked with him, but then when the government changed, I've had an excellent relationship with uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. Um, and, and, and so that is only because you are determined, as you know in business, to say, well, look, there may be some people you like doing business with more than others, or you might have your own opinions about uh, you know, lots of things, but if your job is to work with those people to get stuff done, that's what you do. And so I will take these elections as they come, just as they'll take ours. I may not be here after October 22nd, and maybe somebody else they have to deal with, and they'll have to adjust to that. But I think what the people want is just for us to stop playing these political games, and it's what I'm referring to when I even talk about our own transit. I think people are tired of it. I think they want results for the money that they put in to build these projects. They don't want people politicking and endlessly debating and redeciding and relitigating and, and, and reconsidering. They want us to make decisions based on a fair discussion and based on a majority vote, which is the way our system works, and to get on with it. And that's the approach I've taken. So if you said to me, am I worried in the context of the election about anything other than to try to get the three leaders as we've been trying to do to talk about transit and to talk about housing and then the people can see what they have to say about it, that's what I've been trying to do. That's what I'll continue to do. I will comment on the things that they have pledged uh, to do so that people will know my view as it relates to the well-being of Toronto. Um, but I'm the leader of the Toronto party and uh, so I'll just carry out that job and I'll work with whoever is put there to try and do the stuff that we've been talking about this morning. Okay, so we've talked about the future being now. The future is now, the future is today. Look at the number of people in this room. Look at our industry. But I have another question for you, and this is a question I'd like you to think about looking to the future uh, as we wrap up our, our little chat. Um, this is supposed to be funny, people. You're supposed to laugh at this one. This is the Jetsons. Yeah. Okay, so um, like, work with me, guys. Come on. Um, so in 2030, at the end of your fourth term as mayor of Toronto... That won't be happening. Tell us what you think Toronto will be like. What, what, what would you like Toronto to be like at that time? What, what, what changes do you see coming during that period of time? 
Well, I hope that most of all we focused on what I think people are focused on who want to come here and people who live here in terms of what the people who live here expect and what the people who are coming here, why they say they would come here as opposed to a thousand other places they could go. Which is, I think, in a way, it's the. I hope our values obviously haven't changed because that underlies everything. Our values in terms of how we live with each other. But if you looked at the sort of the physical uh, nature of the city, if I can call it that, the city that we live in, um, I hope that we have made it more sustainable. And some of the things we've done, like uh, Transform TO, which is our climate change plan, some of the things we're doing on. Uh, design and even some of the things we've discussed this morning like transit oriented development and building transit and so on um, have to be sort of done so that people actually can get around the city and have uh, to a far greater extent the option of using public transportation to do that or active transportation for that matter. Um, and I think we have to have addressed the housing uh, situation so that people actually can have a decent affordable place to live including all the way through to pardon me making sure that the social housing we provide for those who are most disadvantaged is um, in the kind of proud state that parts of Regent Park are now in as opposed to some of the other examples we could cite that are still not as yet renewed or repaired or redeveloped. Um, and then I think we have, to, we have to focus on all the other aspects of livability. We've frankly done, because we focus today on transit and housing, which are hugely important and are, uh, are uh, crucial building blocks in building a great and livable city, but we haven't talked as much as we might have about uh, open spaces, about libraries and other kinds of public facilities, recreational spaces where we have, again, amazingly after all these years and all the prosperity, um, the biggest deficits occur often it seems to me in the places that need these things the most. You know, the people who most need the, the special resource that is represented by something as simple as a library or a community center, somehow uh, we've ended up in a situation where the people who need it the most have the least. And I think we have to address that deficit and again we have to do it together. I would say that a lot of that stuff has to be done uh, in partnership. Um, it is a city that I hope will have to be by that time, David, in order to be uh, thr thriving and prosperous and to be able to afford all this, a continued magnet for investment, not just people coming to live here, but employers who want to invest here and take a risk here and know they'll get a return and have good people to work for them. And then finally, something we haven't touched on at all and that I'm very determined to continue to address, and it's a big challenge for us, uh, given everything. I can make a lot of complaints about, about the other governments and the help even with the nine billion. Um, the city's finances have to be maintained in a responsible manner. I mean, one of the things that is a factor in people deciding to invest here or not, and I come back to investment all the time, because if you don't have investment and you don't have jobs, then you won't have the money necessary to pay for all these public services we're talking about this morning, including helping affordable housing. And so the city's finances have to be responsibly managed, um, and that includes keeping an eye on where you have taxation levels. I mean, again, I make no apologies for the fact there's lots of people saying to me, you know, really boost those taxes, really just get those up there, you know, because we have more to do. And indeed, I would tell you, we have more to do. Uh, you know, we have lots more to do and lots more investments to make, but if people think the solution to that is simply to jack taxes up, you know, by a very significant amount, they're going to do damage to the very fabric of the city that they're trying to help. We brought in four budgets in a row with inflation or below tax increases. It's been basically at the rate of inflation. And when people say that strangled the city's ability to do things, I would point out to them that in that very same period of time, we've begun to put the money in place to build the transit, but much more importantly, on an operating basis, we've made huge investments in new things that are helping to make the city affordable, which is, as you've heard me saying this morning, hugely important to our ability to kind of thrive. We've brought in free tr transit free for kids 12 and under, and you may say, well, why do your kids get that? Well, that's the way we do things here, but it's really meant to benefit families for whom that would mean a big difference in their lives to not have to pay for their kids to go shopping on the transit. We're bringing in a fare pass this year that's going to allow lower income people on disability pension and so on to have a discount on their transit. We're investing in all these kinds of things at the same time as we've kept taxes in, in a reasonable uh, frame. And, and so I just think that's what you're sent there to do. Find ways you know, to, to be more efficient about how you go about your business. I increase taxes at a reasonable level. The rate of inflation seems like a reasonable benchmark. And at the same time, find new and better ways to do things that allow you to invest. And so I think all those things going forward can hopefully produce what I see the test for myself. And it's why I don't worry sometimes when we don't do things exactly when some people say we should be changing this street around or doing this or doing that. I look at it in a 25-year time horizon, as many of you will do in business, and say that my job is to try and make the decisions with my council colleagues today that will make sure 25 years from today that Toronto is still in the top five most livable cities in the world. And if we can do that, then I think we will be sitting here, somebody will be sitting here, I won't be in 25 years having this discussion, uh, and we'll still be talking about Toronto being livable and how do we keep it going 25 years after that. And that's how I see this job, and, and I will put my name on the ballot as I've done in October, and if people, my wife will be thrilled if things don't work out. Um, 
but if they do work out, uh, she won't be so thrilled, but I'll be thrilled to be able to finish uh, the work that we've begun on having a proper transit plan and implementing it getting going on affordable housing where we have just made a tiny start and we need to do much, much more. Um, getting going on much more dedication to uh, open space and public uh, amenities that are gonna help uh, everybody in this city have a chance to live the life that they should have a chance to live. Um, and continuing to attract jobs and last but not least, of course, continuing to make sure that the finances of the city are responsibly uh, well managed. And if that sounds like what I'm telling you I'm gonna do in the next four years if I'm there, that's exactly what it is. And I think if you don't know what it is you're gonna do and you can't name it in three or four fingers, then you're probably lost. So that's what I'll be doing and I hope to be working with you and I need your help if I'm there. I need your help. You are the ones that have the ideas. I have such faith in the private sector and its ingenuity and ways to find, to build things differently and better and cheaper and faster and, and, and cheaper meaning not less expensively is a better word to use and, and how to sort of build better neighborhoods that are complete and how you can partner with us on transit and, and, and public uh, amenities that people need. And so I'm looking forward to uh, having the chance to continue to build those partnerships in the coming years. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for joining me today. Thank you very much.